Please welcome your panel on Envisioning the Future of Media and Entertainment, moderated by CNBC's Senior Media and Entertainment Correspondent, Julia Burston. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We have a fantastic panel today to discuss all of the forces changing the media landscape and what is going to be coming next. I want to quickly introduce our panel, and then we're going to dive right in. Um, we have Jeff Hirsch, who's Chief, Oper Op Chief Operating Officer at STARS, Gail Ann Hurd, CEO of Valhalla Entertainment. We have uh, next to me on this side, Charles King, uh, CEO of Macro, Asif Satchuf at Valance Media, and Jeremy Zimmer down at the end from United Talent Agency. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, there's no doubt that the media industry has transformed dramatically over the past several decades, but it seems like the pace of change is speeding up and the past decade, the change has really been defined by the rise of Netflix and the rise of streaming. At first, it disrupted the home entertainment market, disrupted television, but also increasingly changing the movie industry as well. As we look um, at the next wave of change, it seems like the number of streamers is only going to inc increase more dramatically in the next couple of years. They're already over 100 streamers, as Gail and I were talking about earlier, but now we're going to see even bigger players enter the market. We have Apple TV Plus launching in the fall, Disney Plus launching in the fall, um, and then early next year we'll see NBC Universal um, come in with an ad-supported play. So the streaming landscape is changing dramatically, and the question now, I think, is can any of these players really rival Netflix, and what is that going to mean um, as people try to figure out how to, how to create their own digital bundles. So I'm going to um, pick on Jeff first, <laughs> um, because Stars, of course, is part of the traditional TV bundle, um, which is, is shrinking with cord cutting, but you're also going direct to consumer. What are you seeing in terms of the opportunity to grow your direct to consumer market, but also knowing that all these new players are about to come in and make that harder? That's a good question. I think we wrestle with that every day. Uh, you know, Stars is a premium service that has historically been sold on top of basic cable or, or digital cable. And so as you see these large services come in that are actually trying to be all things for everybody, it actually really helps our business because we see we envision a world where we'll be sold on top of Netflix, we'll be sold on top of Disney Plus, we'll be sold on top of Hulu like we are today. But I think the big change is that the world is shrinking in a big way. Technology has made going global really easy and a, and a rapid deployment. And so we're now you know, looking at launching, you know, we, we've said publicly 15 markets in the next three years, but we think we'll do much more of that. We can ride on the backs of the Amazons, we can ride on the backs of the Apples and, and enter markets that we could have never gotten into economically before. Um, and what's amazing is that everyone on this panel is working both with the streamers and with the traditional companies. And so you all have experience <coughs> going, you know, whether taking a project to an Amazon or a Netflix or to a, a, a traditional company, and there doesn't seem to be any division. People are going back and forth. Asif, Media Rights Capital, which is owned by your company, really made its name with House of Cards. And now you're, you have shows, you're just listing off some of them, both with, uh, both with the Hulus of the world and also um, with the traditional companies. How do you see the streaming landscape having changed since House of Cards and, and from just from your perspective working with these companies. Yeah, can I just step back a moment and just add to the, to the uh, question you asked about, you know, can people compete with Netflix? Because I think that informs mm -hmm. how we think about where we place, uh, place our bets and our, our content. I mean, the first is it's just really important to keep in mind that Netflix has done an unbelievable and incredible job, but if you just step back and you look at the whole ecosystem with a slightly longer historical lens, looking back, eight or nine years ago, because again, House of Cards, which is one of the first shows on Netflix, only, that's six years ago. So they've only been in the game, they've only been doing this uh, for about six or seven years. Um, 10 years ago, HBO was, I mean, their position in the industry was at the absolute peak. Um, if you had a show at a five or six million dollar per episode show, you only had one place to go. Um, today, you have six or seven different places to go. So what does that mean? Netflix can grow fast, so others can as well? I'm sorry? Does, that, does the speed of Netflix's rise indicate that there's room for others to scale that yeah, quickly? I think, I think what's happened is Netflix is, you know, with these large-scale technology players who've entered the space, um, they move much faster, they can move capital very, very quickly, and that's created, a, a, that's just accelerated change in the entire ecosystem. And it's caused uh, traditional, in quotes, companies 
to have to alter their business models. And now, again, just coming back to it, there are multiple players uh, playing in, in, in scaled ways. And for us as a content provider, the benefit of that is that we can look at a show and say, where do we think the best home is? You know, who is the um, executive or business leader at, uh, at the various platforms who really understands this show and can get the creative and can figure out the marketing? Um, you know, having that choice, is a, is a, it, that's a wonderful place to be, and that's not where we were 10 years ago. And Charles, what do you think? Yeah. Are all these buyers better for you as a seller of content? I mean, I think right now this is a, an incredible period of time to be a content creator. I mean, there's more and more outlets that are becoming available. Uh, I look at the content that we're focused on, which is really people of color, you know, this fastest growing demographic that's uh, pushing culture both domestically and globally. And knowing that you have all of these new outlets that are thirsty for content, it's a tremendous opportunity now to actually be uh, basically in a driver's seat to provide that content. And frankly, the big challenge within all of it, with all of the new platforms, all it takes is, as, as, as Asif said, is two, two shows. One or two shows can really launch one of these platforms. And, uh, and so if you can be in a position of being in, you think about even stars, I mean, power, Rick drove that network prior to, uh, you know, tr prior to Lionsgate coming in and acquiring it. And so for a company like ours that's early in the stages, that's fulfilling a void in the marketplace, I mean, it's just incredible opportunity. And basically what we want to do is make sure we're in a place where we actually have ownership within our content and our library, which is becoming more of a challenge at Netflix, given uh, just they're looking to own everything at this point. But now that you have other buyers, you're able to be much more aggressive in terms of the, the deals that you're making. Um, Gail, what's your perspective on this? You, you, you've talked a little bit in the past about sort of the advantages of transparency in selling to the streamers and the downsides and sort of the lack of meritocracy and compensation. Walk us through how you feel about selling to this, these streaming players. Well, th that is something that is a content creator. Um, and if you're a content owner, you have a potential revenue stream um, in an aftermarket and ancillary markets if you're with a more traditional broadcaster or um, cable, basic cable or premium cable. This is something I know Jeremy was talking about earlier, which is when you sell to, to Netflix now, that's it. There is no net profits, there's no gross profits, there's you know, what, you, what you get as your compensation um, for each episode or for the rights is it. So I think that that is something that people will gradually wake up to and realize that unless they're one of those amazing showrunners who got the, you know, um, you know, hundred million dollar deals with them, um, that you would do better if you were with a more traditional network. But you have shows with both traditional and, and I think it's Amazon right now um, at the same time. And is the experience as a creator different working with these two types of entities? You know, I, I, it's, it's very much the same in terms of you, you get the notes and all of that, but, but it is different in that um, for Amazon, the, the big thing is because people are binge watching, they need the viewer to click on the next episode. So it's very much how you end one episode and how you start the next. Whereas, um, you know, in basic cable, you want to keep people so that when the ads come up, they don't switch the channel and move to something else if they're, if they're watching, which luckily Walking Dead is one of the shows that people watch when it's actually broadcast. So, um, so it is a little bit different in terms of the, the creative notes. The great thing is that, you know, you don't have to consider, you know, where the ads are. Mm -hmm. when you're writing the content. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And what about you, Jeremy? I mean, you have clients who, who want to figure out how to maximize their time and, uh, and want to sell their content, whether they're actors or directors or writers. How does this all, or maybe not writers right now, um, but um, that's a whole other uh, conversation. But um, how do you feel about these new players? Do you think that the more buyers, the better? Or are we hitting peak TV? Well, I think the more buyers, the better is, is a general outlook. I don't know, and I think Asif's right to point out that, you know, six years ago, Netflix was kind of an upstart and HBO was the one everybody wanted to work with. And then, you know, you know we're, in, we're in this, we're on this journey, right, this continuum and, and trying to point out like this is Netflix won or someone lost. I think you can't really look at it that way. There's this constant evolution going on. And 
so for today, Netflix is a place people, our creators really love because there's a lot of econo- there's a lot of creative freedom. The economics have been good, although they're getting uh, more difficult to deal with. And people are finding that they can have great success at Hulu. And in fact, people still love going to HBO. And they're seeing like a phenomenon like Game of Thrones happens at HBO. And it's hard to create that phenomenon at Netflix because everything gets dropped at once. Mm-hmm. And so the, view, the conversation cycle is so quick at Netflix, whereas the conversation cycle around a show like HBO goes on and on as it gets you know, worked week after week. So, and I think artists love that. They love being in the conversation week after week after week. So I think that there's a lot of different, you know, different shows for different places at different times for the right people, I think is very much how we look at every situation. And do you have certain clients who say, I don't want to sell my movie to Netflix, like we saw with Crazy Rich Asians. They said, I want this to be a theatrical release. Yes. I don't want to have this be streamed and lost in, in a mass of other content um, on my browser. Um, how do you manage those conversations to make sure it's the best thing for, for, the, for this, you know, eat whatever the particular... Well, there's so many content. dynamics that go into play because if you want to make a certain kind of movie, but you, want to need, but you need to make it for $30 million, those kinds of movies are very difficult to get made at that price point in the traditional theatrical ecosystem. So Netflix will say, sure, we'll make your difficult... Uh, or smaller movie, it's not even that difficult, but we'll make that movie that no one else wants to make, but we're going to release it the way we want to release it. And so the filmmakers are making these difficult choices between making the movie they want to make, but not having it not released theatrically, or trying to make it theatrically on a much more limited budget and hoping that it catches on. And those are conversations we have, and we're very, you know, these are the, this is the give and the take, and, you know, the opportunity lives somewhere in the middle. The opportunity lives... In, some, in, in, a, in, a, in a smarter, more thoughtful, more uh, efficient way of marketing movies that people can fall in love with in a more theatrical, con- in a more traditional context. Charles, you're nodding in response here. I'm in agreement because we literally you go through this every single week. I mean, you have options and you basically have to weigh them out. You can go work with Netflix in one case where your budget might be slightly higher, but then you're you're capping your upside opportunity, as Gail mentioned, but your content creator, your filmmaker, may have a much larger budget. And so you're just having those conversations every single day. But the great thing about it is there's options and there's, there's no right way. And you just have to figure out what is gonna be the best scenario, distribution platform and partnership for each one of the pieces of content that you're creating. Um, it's, it's interesting hearing Netflix release slightly more information about how many people are watching some of their hit shows, and they put them in their earnings letter, their letter to shareholders. It's not a traditional press release, but it's like they're trying to remind people how massive their reach really is. Um, Asif, when you were doing House of Cards, how much data did you get, and how important is viewership data for you to understand how to craft your shows? Uh, I think it's a complicated question. I think... Looking ahead, I think data uh, can be uh, just an incredible source of um, an incredible resource to improve the creative quality of the shows. I think the challenge that people have is, is is that in order to get that data incorporated into the creative of the show, you have to share that data with artists, and that means representatives and producers, and that has implications uh, on a couple of different fronts. One is compensation systems which is people then know uh, if their shows are hits or not. And it goes back to the meritocracy question. Um, and that's complicated because a cost plus deal for a hit show uh, is, you know, in hindsight, doesn't look like such a good deal. Um, and for the failures, a uh, cost plus deal is, is an overpay. The second thing is, is that I think the data piece, there needs to be, because um, data without insights and data without a large enough sample size can really lead to some dangerous decision making. And I think Netflix, it's really interesting, their move towards transparency, I actually think six years later from their first launch, I think it's probably probably about the right time. Um, Because again, they just started six years ago, the sample size was probably big enough, three or four, maybe 
two years ago. Um, and then the frameworks and the context that's required, um, I think is, it probably takes a couple years to figure that out. But you have a unique perspective here, Asif, because in addition to Valens owning Media Rights Capital, you also own Billboard. Yeah. So Billboard is a very valuable public presentation of success. Yeah. Will we see the streamers ever get anywhere close to that? Or what is your, ha having the perspective of owning Billboard, what should the industry Yeah, I mean, I think Billboard is, uh, in my mind, and of course we're biased because we own it, um, but the reason we own it and what attracted us to the, to, the, to the company was that strategic position inside the ecosystem where it is a independent third party um, uh, tracking system, um, which everyone looks at in the industry and can say, you know, that's the basis in which we can build a meritocracy. And that is a very, very valuable thing. Business ecosystems that are based on meritocracies uh, tend to really outperform, um, you know, cost plus ones, particularly uh, when you're talking about an asset class that has fairly volatile outcomes. Now, if we could have an ecosystem that's based on a meritocracy with free healthcare, I'd be even happier. But you know. I, I, Look, I think data, you know, as you move to a direct-to-consumer world where historically most of everybody in this town has been a wholesaler, right? And so you hand off a piece of content to somebody else and the consumer is somebody else's problem. Now, all of a sudden, you're actually dealing with consumers every day and you're dealing with stuff like lifetime value and churn. And when it's really important to get that data, so we're, A, how you schedule the show, be what pieces of content you put behind it to extend lifetime value. You know, Power is a great example. It's a, it's a massive hit for us. We see our direct-to-consumer business spike as soon as Power comes on. We know there's a large group of people who, it's like college kids, will come on on day one, will leave on the last episode, and there's nothing we can do to keep them. But we also know that when you watch Power and you watch three or four other movies, that your lifetime value is three or four months longer. And on that kind of business, it's huge in terms of revenue growth. So it helps you figure out when you go back to buy a library, instead of just buying a bulk library, you buy a library that you know has characteristics that actually feed your core content. And that helps ultimately how you grow that direct-to-consumer business. So it's imperative to us. Gail, you want to weigh in here? On the um, I, I do, because I think the difference also is that the metrics that are applied to a startup, even though Netflix isn't a startup, and profitability, the traditional media companies could never lose the kind of money that Netflix that operating in the red. Yeah. Um, and I think we're, we're seeing that there are different rules being applied. So you've got a company, let's say like an Amazon, that was operating in the red for a very long period of time. And their whole focus, I think, is something that Netflix wants, which is they want to be the, they want to be sort of the Amazon of streaming, even though Amazon has moved into that as well. Um, and Amazon is now a profitable company. So the only way that Netflix can continue, can at some point be profitable, is by driving others out. Um, and uh, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see whether or not uh, Netflix is acquired whether they partner with another company or, um, you know, or whether Wall Street kind of goes, at what point will you become profitable? It's interesting because this whole thing that we're talking about, this idea that Netflix pays up front, you don't have the residuals, is one factor <clears throat> that the writers are citing in their conflict with the agents. And I'm pointing at you, Jeremy, because I'm going to ask you about this. But so the, the, writer, the Writers Guild and the Association of Agencies um, are uh, at an impasse over renegotiating their terms, and the writers say that their salaries have dropped by about 20% over the past five years, in part because of the rise of streaming, um, as well as uh, these packaging fees, which are the source of this conflict. Um, give us your perspective on how the shifting landscape is making it harder for you to come to terms with what I would guess would be a pretty large part of your uh, clientele. Super softball. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I wasn't aware that there Ouch. was a conflict. Um, I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, I mean, the streaming world has changed many things. And one of the things they've, it's changed is the way that writers are hired and the, the length of orders that are, are done for a show. So you see a you know, typical order now on uh, Netflix is eight, ten episodes. Yeah. And writers have always been paid on a per episode basis. And to make a eight or 10 episode show for a streamer is, you know, a, I don't know, it can be 30 weeks, 35 weeks. So they're not paid by the week, they're paid by the episode. So even, or by the script. 
or in some by cases. yeah. So, but instead, so instead of being paid for 24 episodes over a you know 42 week period, they're being paid for eight episodes over a 30 week period, and that just amounts to less money. Mm -hmm. Now, there's lots that w can be done about that, um, but I think the best way to be, have that be done is in a partnership between us and our clients, as we have traditionally encountered every change that's come about, and we've managed to continue to uh, create great opportunities for our writers. I think that the larger issue around streaming, which is really interesting to me, is we've, we saw the music business really go into a chasm in the beginning of streaming as, uh, you know, basically there was no physical goods anymore. And, and I think there's some elements of our business that's suffering from the diminishment of, of physical goods being sold. And I do think that part of this data conversation comes around to when will or should and when will Netflix and other streamers pay a streaming royalty on content? And isn't that a way that you'll have a real meritocracy so that the shows that people are really watching will actually, the, the people who create those shows and work on those shows will get additional revenue based on the fact that people are watching and the shows that people aren't watching, they won't, which is a meritocracy. And you see now that Spotify and Apple Music, I mean, they're such a vital part of the overall ecosystem. And it's really, you know, the music business has gone through a tremendous resurgence as a result of that. So I do think that reinstituting some sort of back end is important. I also think, and this speaks to Gail's issue around the profitability of these companies, because I do think you think about House of Cards, we were talking about this the other day. House of Cards has been sitting on that, you know, I, I call it the, dis, the digital dustbin for six years now. You know, I don't know how many people are watching House of Cards now. I don't know how many people are subscribing to Netflix to watch House of Cards now. Yet that's great, great content. And wouldn't that be great content for CBS or for the Comcast AVOD? So I think, you know, in this moment in time, Netflix is running their business the way they're doing it. But I, I can imagine a world where there are secondary markets for content that's made for streamers. I can imagine a world where the there'll be enough money driven to the AVODs by brands because that's, brands have been a massive part of the financial ecosystem of the entertainment business forever. And right now they're sort of, we're all, we barely talk about them. And the brands need a place to play and they need a place to invest. And I think they're gonna figure out how they can get behind some of these, stream, these AVOD platforms in a significant way and give them the firepower to compete for content um, and, and, and become much more vibrant in the ecosystem. Yeah, it's interesting because... It, you like know, how I dodged the whole... Yeah, so I, I, was good, I, wasn't I, it? I, I respect that, um, but we'll ask <laughs> you a quick follow-up. My comms um, people are yeah. so proud of me right now. <laughs> um, my, my quick follow-up before we move on to some of these other issues you raised um, is that when, you know, this whole idea of packaging fees is a transformation of your business, of the agency business, and um, shows you know the agency business in, in, in transition. You used to be an agent at WME, and we've seen um, you know that business change. You know now it's part of Endeavor, and there it's a much more diverse business. But I I wonder if you you see the growing importance of packaging fees reflecting the fact that there aren't movie stars like Tom Cruise who get a huge percentage of growth, and, and your business is changing uh, with the decline of other factors. I mean, packaging fees have always been a very significant part of the overall revenue of, of the larger agencies, as television shows and television syndication have been a huge part of all the media companies. It's just been that way forever. So um, it's always been important. It remains important. It's something that we think is good for the agency and good for the clients, because the part that's sort of getting washed out here is when clients participate in a package, they don't pay commission. So you have not just writers, but you have writers, actors, directors, producers, below the line talent, editors, et cetera. Anyone who's represented at the agency that has a package or a piece of the package doesn't pay commission. So it's our way of investing in programming that we believe in by not taking our commission and betting on the back end. And when those shows work, which some of them do, we make a lot of money. And when they don't, which many of them don't, we lose money. And it's been a pretty simple and well understood and well documented relationship for a very long time. 
and it's kind of surprising to me that we're having this fight right now. Um, we don't have anyone on the panel representing the Writers Guild. Does anyone want to respond to Jeremy? Before I, mean, I, I would add to it that I think that um, everything that Jeremy said is correct, but, and I think that it's also been smart that the, the, the agencies, particularly the two large ones, and I know that UTA and MRC have a, a, a joint venture to finance uh, and select cases content and alongside their content creators that they're representing. And I think that's a natural evolution in terms of diversification of revenue stream. Uh, with knowing that there's been a compression of packaging fees and we're looking at less you know, syndication fees and revenue coming into the agencies as well as the larger fees from movie star first dollar gross uh, participation. And so I think that it makes sense and it's been a part of what's been needed to, to diversify those companies as they've all grown and, and are responding to changes in the ecosystem. But I also do think that when, you're, when it's handled in the right way, even though that there can be some inherent conflict within it, but as long as it's addressed up front and, and handled in a smart way, I think that there are ways where there can be opportunities, frankly, for those artists to uh, actually perform well and actually have deals that may be better than they would be tradition with traditional studios that may not necessarily, necessarily be connected into the larger ecosystem. But I think transparency is, is important in each one. Although of I do have to say that you, that the agencies do get a packaging fee per episode. So you're not entirely betting on the back end. Well, it depends. You're right. But frequently the amount of commission we defer is greater than the episodic fee. Right, so if we have... Uh, yeah, obviously, yeah, it's a case-by-case so case basis. It's yeah. not like we're sure. taking zero. Exactly. Although we would consider it, but <laughs> probably reject I'll it. talk to you later, about, uh, <laughs> since UTA represents me. Yes, yeah. indeed. <laughs> and thank you, by yeah. the way. <laughs> um, so it's interesting because you've been talking about uh, streaming, and mostly in the context of television, and haven't really looked at what the streaming business is doing to the movie industry, and... Um, I'm curious what you think, Charles, as also a filmmaker. Yeah. Um, what do you think when Netflix spends $100 million to make a movie that may or may not end up in theaters? Is that good or bad for the industry? I think it depends on the movie. I think in some cases you're like, thank God, yes, spend that $100 million, because <coughs> frankly, what it was going to take to market that film, to get people out in theaters, to get them to leave their home to go see that film, at times, it's, it's challenging. You're competing with eyeballs in so many ways, whether it's kids on games and platforms and watching things on YouTube and social media or going to live events and, and concerts. And so I, I think that it has to be eventized to get people out mm -hmm. of theaters, and you really have to be smart and thoughtful in how that's done. So I think that what it's done is it's provided another lane and opportunity and avenue for your content to reach the consumer. So I, I think it's case by case. I think there's movies, obviously, like the global success of certain franchises from Marvel and other places where mm -hmm. clearly y it shows it's eventized and there's a marketplace for it. But I think there are others where it might make sense to do it that way. I mean, y Gail, you made some of these movies that were sort of iconic box office successes, like Terminator, that people needed to go see the first couple of weekends. Do you think that Netflix investing more in films and really pushing to close the window is going to have ripple effects on the industry? I think you'll always see that, you know, the tent poles will be protected. Um, and yet my favorite movie of last year was Roma. And I have to give real credit to Netflix for financing Roma, because otherwise I think one of the great movies of the year would not have um, broken out, because they got behind it in a huge way in marketing and promoting it. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, the number of choices that you have on Netflix now, it's really difficult to find a lot of the films that my friends are making. Uh, you know, someone will, will send me something saying, you know, my movie is dropping on Netflix tomorrow, and I've heard nothing about it except from my friend announcing that on Facebook. I agree. It's case by case. I mean, Mudbound was our film in the year mm -hmm. before, and, you know, it was, I haven't met a person around the, the, the globe that frankly hasn't seen the movie when I've been out and I've mm -hmm. traveled. And they did everything that they said they were going to do, and they shared the data in terms of how many times the film was viewed, and they were absolutely the best choice for us when we financed and made the movie independently and we took it to Sundance. They were absolutely the best buyer and distributor of that film. But it, it, it really, you, have to, you do have to break through, and I think it's becoming more challenging now in the marketplace with the volume of original movies to make sure that your film 
is that one that actually breaks through all of the content that's on the platform. But do you think we'll see Netflix's push to release movies on streaming and also in theaters with a very short window will push the studios, which some many of whom have been advocating to close this window for a long time. I would say the sole exception is probably Disney. Disney's probably the only one who isn't interested in collapsing that window a little bit. Will we start to see this happen this year? Asif, what do you think? I mean, this is the tension that the studios and, and exhibitors have had for for decades. Um, and I think as, you know, so they're, they're uh, uh, but I think the introduction of new players like, like Netflix that give um, an additional sort of, they give additional leverage to the studios in that, in that discussion. I mean, it's kind of classic Porter's Five Forces that, that just increases negotiating leverage. Now, I think there's a few ways that it will play out. It will first, I think it'll first play out in remit rates from exhibitors. Um, so that, w that I think is more of a tactical negotiation. Um, but longer term, yeah, I see those windows continuing the historical trend of, of uh, compressing. Yeah, it's amazing. They've, it's been stuck at that three month mark for quite a long time. I, I, but people love to go to the movies. People I mean, love, I mean know, as we saw with the Avengers last weekend. It's amazing, yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no product on the planet that does that kind of revenue in a single weekend except for a movie. I mean, it's a spectacular thing and people do love to go to the movies. And mm -hmm. I think one of the fundamental problems we have is that the, the disconnect between the people who own theaters and the people who make movies is, is pretty broad. And I think it's, it's, getting, it's, it's not getting better. So what would you want the theater owners to, be, to know or to think about? I mean, I would want the theater owners to, first of all, really uh, either invest in or uh, partner with real data providers so they understand who the consumer is. I'd like them to make the experience as great as possible. I'd like them to embrace a technology like, I know you can't say movie pass without being stoned, but like movie pass, uh, and Did you have really to say that sitting right beside me <laughs> with the stoning? Yeah, sorry. So I'd like to. <laughs> so uh, you know, I, I think I think you know they have consistently fought against any real advancement or enhancement of technology or data on a real basis, and that's. And the, in, the movie industry has suffered as a result of that. But do you think this will be the year that maybe Warner Brothers or Universal, two studios that have, have said publicly that they're interested in bringing out movies on home entertainment closer to the theatrical release? Will this will I it think happen? They, they may move it up a little bit. I really, I really don't know. I think it'll be hard because, you know, right now Disney has such incredible leverage at the theaters and with the theater owners that if, and if, if, Warners or Universal were to give the theater owners a reason to back away from their product and give Disney even more favorable treatment, it would be bad for them. So I think they have to, we all have to, everybody has to figure out what's best for the overall ecosystem and play together. I also think the theaters and theater owners could be such a vital part of the marketing and distribution ecosystem, which is really broken. I mean, it's beautiful that, you know, for, for Avengers Endgame, you can spend $150 million to market the movie. That's probably a good investment, although since everyone on the planet knew it was coming, I don't know why you needed to. But for a movie like Mudbound, which is a beautiful movie, the fact that there's not enough financial support to market that movie effectively so that it can have a theatrical release is really unfortunate. And the fact that you have to spend $40 million to market a $10 million movie is crazy. Yeah. So that's where I think the theater owners need to work with the, with the financiers, with the studios, to create a better system for everybody. Although yeah. I, I will say that I do, I do think that we're seeing that with some of the distributors like A24, Neon and others that are now effectively using social media and other tools. To some degree, but the problem with A24 yeah. is they, you, you, know, you can't make a movie for more than $6 million with them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a whole segment of that's true. content that just does, can't exist. Between tiny and large. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's where the problem exists. And it would be amazing if someone did actually try this year. I mean, I, for a couple of yeah. reasons. And, you know, one is just, you know, we're talking about the future of media and entertainment and the amount of, of velocity and change that's happening everywhere else in the ecosystem is just huge. Yeah. And if nothing else, then just to 
get the exhibitors to try to experiment and to try, you know, whether they're forced to or not, whether they're forced to, it can still lead to positive knock-on effects where they embrace the cultural change that all of us have sort of uh, had to go through. Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of other factors here. There's sort of this question of what counts as a movie, and I was very surprised that um, Megan Del Rahim, who's the head of the antitrust division at the Department of Justice, sent a letter to the Academy saying, don't change your rules to exclude Netflix. The, which I don't understand how they would have effect because the Academy is a private organization. Well, they, they didn't change their rules, so it, it ended up being a non-issue. But the fact that this is a question that has uh, been elevated to the Department of Justice, I thought was kind of surprising. I think that's the effect of lobbying. Well, that, <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Uh, but it sort of speaks to the fact that there was this question, like, what is a movie? What counts as theatrical release? And then what we were just talking about here is this, you know, will marketing evolve so that films can either be distributed more efficiently or can be marketed to a global, um, to a, you know, a global community um, with the same efficiency that we found in all these technologies like streaming? And I'm curious, Jeff, you talked about launching in all these different markets. When you take your content global, how does your distribution that and your marketing reflect um, the new places where you're going? And is it different because you're marketing something that's direct to consumer now? It's not, it's different by territory, uh, depending on the market, whether it's UK or it's Germany or it's Italy or Spain. The, you know, we have a very premium female kind of point of view on our domestic content. That seems to play very, very well in Europe right now, where most of everything is so sports driven that there is a, a gap in that kind of female focused content. But that's not to say in Germany we don't have to have locally produced content. In Spain, we have to have locally produced content. And so it's really different depending on the territory and depending on what the content mix is. Generally speaking, because right now we're riding on the back of somebody else's platform, which we usually do, uh, most of the co marketing we do is on platform. As we start to roll a direct-to-consumer product into a market later in the year, then we really have to step in and start to buy off-channel kind of uh, uh, assets. And so we'll see. Uh, in the, <clears throat> um, you know, entertainment has always been a huge export for the U.S. And it seems like now, though, things are getting even more global. And we just saw Avengers do these insane numbers overseas. And with this shocking resonance of a piece of American content resonating in every single market around the world, and at the same time, we're seeing more content be imported, um, shows on Netflix, you know, or, that are originals in other countries coming here. Um, I'm curious to hear how you all think about the sort of the globalism of uh, of content, the the fact that there is this, there's no longer just this one-way export business um, of a certain type of content, but a real back and forth. Um, or maybe you disagree with me, Jeremy. Well, I, I mean, I, I think what's been interesting to me is historically, I mean, I, I was thinking about it with the UK. The UK created two of the biggest franchises in the history of the movie business in Harry Potter and Bond. Both of them are UK IP, mm -hmm. UK producers, UK stars. All of them came to the United States and became the property of US companies distributed then on a global basis. And I don't think that's ready to change because where we look at the international market as a market, it's really a series of smaller markets that don't have that sort of power. And for whatever reason, we've been able to be this sort of global distribution platform and this global source. And what's great about technology is it's tying us all together but I still think that idea of how do you create and distribute content on a global basis is something that we have a unique ability to do and understand. Asif, do you think about tweaking content for different markets differently? I mean, do you create content with a different eye to the global reception than you did when you were starting out in this business? Oh, for sure. I mean, I'll just take you through an example of uh, a movie we did with uh, Seth MacFarlane was Ted. Um, what we did on Ted was, uh, in international territories, you know, you, you often have to voice over, you have to do dubbing to, for, the, for the voices. Um, and instead of just getting unknown actors, what we did is we actually went into those local territories and actually um, cast really well-known comedians in those, in those markets. Now, we made that decision uh, very early on uh, in the development process, so it was before, um, before it turned into a hit. But uh, that decision, if you look at the foreign performance, um, you know, our view is that that significantly increased the global, uh, the global take for 
Uh, otherwise, I think historically you'd look at it and say it's an R-rated comedy with a fairly American bent. Um, those tend not to travel. Mm -hmm. um, but it's those kinds of, that kind of, absolutely we're thinking about those. those. And do you see some of these more popular foreign uh, TV shows in particular being competition for your shows? Like a Fauda or something. I mean, people I mean, are talking about this show. Does that mean that people are choosing between watching one of your shows and that kind of show? Well, I, so my take on it is, is a little bit different. It probably lines up a little more with, with Jeremy, and I think he's right. They sit at a very unique place of identifying um, artists uh, across the globe. And that's really what we're, you know, as an independent, the way we compete is finding brilliant artists wherever they reside and having a global perspective and looking in all the nooks and crannies in every territory trying to find uh, a brilliant voice. Um, that for us uh, can be a tremendous source of future value to our company. Um, and so the increase in international content, it just allows those diverse voices to come to the forefront and we get to see them. Um, so it's kind of a giant R&D pipeline for us. On the topic of diverse voices, uh, Charles, I know this is something you're very focused on. Do you think the, that the s distributors are starting to realize the value there? I mean, definitely we're looking at the globalization of content as well. And frankly, uh, the notion that certain content with people of color at the center of them can't travel, that there's less value, or there's no value for those uh, forms of content, both in television or in features. Uh, internationally, uh, we've, I've just known for years that this is true, and so is every other content creator and movie star that's worked in this space. So even one of the reasons why we even called our company Macro was understanding that we were going against uh, an industry kind of belief and thought, and frankly recognizing that there was tremendous upside opportunity to be a part of actually dispelling that. And what we've seen is there continues to be more and more examples, whether it was Crazy Rich Agents or whether it was Black Panther or even the success of Jordan Peele's work and others that are showing that, frankly, if you can figure out how to make universally themed content that leans into cultural authenticity here on a domestic level, that, and you can find the right ways to market them in each of those regions internationally, and then you travel the talent, that, frankly, the opportunity is there. And I think we'll only continue to see things shift in that direction and we'll see, you know, where in the past maybe 10% of your profits for certain forms of content in that space came from the international marketplace. I think you'll see a much larger percentage now continue to shift. And that's what we're seeing now. And, uh, and so as we think about it, we're looking at, you know, global players or, or artists and filmmakers that are, uh, that are emerging out of regions outside of the United States, but we're also looking at um, being smart and thoughtful on how we can begin to partner with specific distributors and companies uh, in those regions globally where we know there's an interest and thirst for this form of content. Um, Gail, I know you're very focused on a different diversity, the lack of women in the industry, um, and you were just traveling all over the world talking um, to female filmmakers. You've been in this business for a while, but in the past year, there's been a huge attention to this Time's Up movement. Do you see things starting to change? I know we have some statistics, if we could pull up those slides. We have slides. We have great slides with some very scary statistics with the lack of women in the industry. Okay, maybe they'll pull them up. But so, so tell us, tell, tell us so your do, thoughts. So, so, you know, the, the interesting thing is that um, there are more women directing. The interesting thing, though, th is that in 2018, fewer than 4% of the top 100 films at the box office were directed by women, fewer than 4%. That's less than in 1992. Um, so I think, we need to, I think we need to look at why that's the case. Um, yet with films at Sundance, so the independent films, that's gone up tremendously to almost 40%. Um, you know, and I, I think, it's, I think the, the issue is that when women directors are transitioning and looking to make the, the bigger box office films, the ones with a larger budget, they are, they're bumping up against a glass ceiling there. Um, you know, at, at the same time, um, you know, you've got Patty Jenkins directing Wonder Woman, you've got other women directing some of the big tentpole films. So what I'd like to see is that, um, is that it's no longer looked at, oh, well, you know, if one woman directs a successful franchise picture, we'll hire her again. 
but we have to be nervous about any other woman. And, and I'm hoping that it gets to the point where, where that's no longer the case, but we're not there yet. And Jeff, you've had great success at STARS, and your numbers do not reflect this, this minority issue. Yeah, we, you know, our, like I said, our focus is premium female and premium female African-American female. And so over 65% of our showrunners, writers, and directors are actually female. And our, our biggest show of power, Courtney Kemp Agua, is an African-American one. We have probably four or five more shows with her. And she's a fantastic talent. And we, you know, we believe that it's, it's not just the right thing to do, but it's really good business. And so we'll continue to lean into it. Um, and uh, I want to open up to a couple questions, but one topic we didn't get to um, dig into was the topic of privacy, and I know that's something that you're very focused, I'm sorry, piracy, the focus that you're very focused on. Um, why do you think we need to be particularly aware of this issue right now? Because generally our business is always looking to close the barn door, but the horse is already out. I mean, it happened with the studios, with when uh, there were video, where there was VHS video, and then DVDs, and now piracy is huge. Piracy cost um, cost over 34 billion dollars to TV and film entertainment just last year. And the projection is everyone saying, "Okay, well, streaming will save us," but uh, the projection is that there will be 50 billion dollars in lost income from streaming alone between now and 2022. Can I just add a data point to what, uh, what he just mentioned down there? It's just, it's smart in terms of making smart business for stars, I mean, 40%, African Americans watch 40% more television. So that's the one reason why it's smart to invest in that direction and why stars has grown at the pace that they have. They also over-index on the consumption of social media, which is part of why I would imagine that the direct-to-consumer platform with the Stars app has also been growing at the rapid rate. And we also look at the success this past weekend of Avengers. 50% of every person that buys a ticket to see a film is African-American or Latino. And I know when I went to see Endgame and took my, my kids to see it, the largest response from the audience was when the characters from Black Panther showed up. And I would definitely go in to say that a huge part of the success of this movie this past weekend was a much larger audience that was not going to some of the Avenger films before also is now navigated mm -hmm. into the Marvel franchise from it. And it made smart business sense for the way that they were thoughtful in doing that and incorporating those artists into their marketing campaign. Are you seeing from, from the perspective of your clients that um, there's a greater interest in diversity from the studios because they understand how valuable it is to have creators and talent that reflects the audience? A hundred percent. There's just a, a, a hunger. It's more than an openness. It's a hunger. You know, how can we find more diverse writers, more diverse uh, directors, more female directors, more material? And I think it's an interesting point that Gail makes. But you know, if you think about the content, because Patty Jenkins went and did Wonder Woman. If she was probably, she might have passed on Superman. So it also has to do with the content because mm -hmm. the content of the big movies isn't all necessarily content that our female directors are interested in, are excited by, or relate to. So I think when there is content that is designed to be a big movie, but designed to be a big movie from a female perspective, you'll have more... I disagree. Well, you may disagree. <laughs> and, and I think that's kind of the problem, is that studio executives take that perspective. They think, oh, well, this, this film does not have a woman at the center of it, so women won't want to direct this. Well, and I'm just, I, I hear I mean, this... Gail, I'm just telling you, when we submit material right. to our female directors, they pass on those big opportunities to do big studio movies because they don't relate to the material. Now, maybe because there's not, it's just, or they don't think it's good. But they don't want to do it, so that's something that we, you know, that's something that I think is, is, is at the essence of the debate. Well, I, I, what I'm hopeful for is that there will be more diversity, not only, you know, in, in front of the camera, but behind the camera. So the writers and, um, you know, and the executives who are green lighting the films. Because the women that I talk to who direct The Walking Dead, um, and we have 50-50 gender uh, equality on The Walking Dead, um, and uh, is that those women who are directing The Walking Dead, which I think is a great calling card for these big films, want to direct 
the, the Marvel movies and the DC movies, um, and they're not getting the call. They probably are not your clients. Maybe they need so, a better agent. So maybe. Exactly. So maybe, <laughs> and I have to have some time on my hands. <laughs> so you heard it here, folks. Maybe we're going to change. We're going to change representation for women whose whose agents aren't submitting them for those projects. And, and Gail, just on the on the executive. Point. I, I think it's. I think there's a there's a deeper vein there, which is that, you know, it's for us who are in the content creation business. It's, it's actually somewhat easier for us, for us to say, okay, we're making a movie or a TV show over here. Let's have diversity over there, which, you know, our company is is deeply committed to. But I think your point about the executives and looking inward and saying what's happening inside our company, um, I think, changing. Um, the composition inside our own businesses, it, it really does need to start there. I mean, if you look at our TV group, every head of every department, including the head of the group, is a woman. If you look at the head of uh, the woman, the person running Billboard and the Hollywood Reporter is uh, a woman. And those are fairly recent changes that we made, but you can already start to see that there's a broadening in, uh, of the consideration of the types of projects that we're we're going after. Um, I do want to get to audience questions, but I'm going to ask a final question. And this is really mostly directed at um, Asif and Jeff, although I guess, Charles, you also. We've seen such massive consolidation, and that's been um, an underlying part of this conversation. But is it hard for independent companies that are not the giants anymore? I mean, now I was just talking to someone, CBS is a smaller media giant these days compared to the consolidated AT&T Time Warner and, um, and the consolidated Disney Fox. So is it harder to compete? Um, Jeff? Yeah, I, I like to say scale matters, but people matter more. I think in these large companies, you know, it gets, you know, there's 40 to 50 people in a room trying to make a decision and the pace of change with technology, you have to be able to make decisions, move quickly and try things. And I think there's a point where you're too big and you can't react to the marketplace. And you know, our view is by time AT&T gets their service out the door, Disney gets their service out the door and starts to look internationally, we have a three-year window where we can run internationally before anybody shows up. And so you know, scale does matter. It matters in buying content. I mean, obviously Netflix is spending $13 billion a year on content. That would be amazing if we could do that. Um, it also makes us you know, laser focused on data much more picky about what we what we choose to put on the air. It also makes us really focus on what we put on the air to make sure it works and give it the, the path out. But I do think there's a certain point of scale where it actually becomes disruptive to, with change than it actually is effective. Yeah, I think a slightly different answer for, for, for me in that, you know, uh, we were subscale 10 years ago and we're still subscale, right? By definition, we now have the largest companies in the world who have now entered in the space. So strangely, we've actually been fairly comfortable in terms of operating in those kinds of ecosystems. Um, that's the first thing. Second thing is, in an ecosystem that is undergoing significant change and volatility, if we build our culture right, those are exactly the, 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 the environments where independence can do really well um, because it creates opportunities to program in different ways. Um, so whether it was putting House of Cards on Netflix, people thought we were crazy for doing that initially. In hindsight, it all worked out. But it, that opportunity would not have existed unless there was a fairly significant change in, uh, in the ecosystem. And then the third thing is, is that you know, artists, you can't really consolidate artists. I mean, the brilliance of an artist, how do you consolidate that? I don't, uh, my experience has been that they don't like to be consolidated. Um, so for us, you know, finding great artists, providing them with a better experience, um, you know, maybe being subscale in those types of interactions, um, it, 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 it can be an advantage. I, I would agree. I mean, it's really right now um, being able to be nimble with all of the changes and the chaos and disruption for a small company where you can pivot and change direction where needed is invaluable. And I'd also add to that that when you're able to connect authentically with artists and content creators when they're faced with a, a myriad of opportunities and places to work with, I mean, there's numerous times where there's a project that's going out in the marketplace where it's Netflix and Apple and others where they'll actually start with macro instead and know that they're at a place that they can incubate them and develop their content with a level of understanding and independence. And then we can work together to figure out the right platform to bring their content to. And so it can help us with what's happening in the marketplace right now. Gail, you want the last word on this one? 
I've forgotten what the question was. What was the question? <laughs> Competing in, in an incre increasingly consolidated media landscape. You know, the, the, the truth is that, that it's only consolidated if you look at the number of places, but those places, especially in television and streaming, are buying more. Mm -hmm. um, the, the fact that, I think John Landgraf said there were 485 or so um, series. That we've never seen anything close to that. Um, so obviously the, there's a lot more content out there. The, the difference then becomes, you know, what, what's good content? How do you define good content? And how do you get people to find it and watch it? Um, and we're, we're back to the, the thing that, that, um, that Steve was talking about before, which is it is great to be able to watch Twitter when your episode of a series is coming on and you see people going crazy and crying and, and it, that is the kind of thing that, that you get in a movie theater when you go see a movie like, um, like Avengers over the weekend and you get it shared through social media when you have appointment television. And I'd like to think that, that that's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, perfect opportunity to open up for a couple of questions from the audience. Anyone raise their hand? We got this one right here. Yeah, if you were to look uh, 10 years from now, would you expect to see a lot more content on a per, uh, percentage basis being produced overseas, like in India, in other mm -hmm. locations, China perhaps? Uh, for us, so we definitely think that's going to happen. I mean, we, we have to start producing local content in the markets that we're going into to be successful. So for sure, yes, absolutely. I'm doing co-productions with a number of different countries, uh, producers and directors in those countries. Um, and, you know, a, as you said, I mean, that, that, that's where you, you look to find people with unique voices, um, with different perspectives, and the audience seems to be responding in a really positive way as the world becomes more connected. I would also say that as we look to create content uh, at the right, you know, kind of price point, uh, especially independently positioned companies will continue to look at other regions globally where they can produce that content efficiently. Uh, and cost effectively, and uh, even though they may be domestically driven, I think that will only continue to uh, to grow over time. Great, and there's one right here. Hi, I've been working with um, universities for the last couple of years, <coughs> excuse me, over how to introduce new content to the market. And do you look at the market as a opportunity where doors are going to open up more or less based on the way the structure of the industry is today. So, so I'm sorry, let me try to explain better. We have a lot of young kids coming out of NYU, USC that have a lot of desires to contribute where getting that jump, you know, they used to be able to enter into film festivals and things like that. Today, film festivals now spend three, six million dollars, ten million dollars to buy films that entry level thing is kind of much harder to find. How do, how do these kids look to find I, I There are more film festivals now than ever before, and it's maybe a $50 entrance fee that will often be waived. So, I, so those festivals are actually not buying films. Uh, there are market festivals um, where films are purchased by, the, by distributors. Um, but the, the ecosystem for film festivals in terms of how much it costs to get your foot in the door, uh, that hasn't changed. I'd also add too, I mean, the way for young content creators to get their, their voice into the marketplace is so much easier now with social media. I mean, I, one of UTA's clients had a, created a three minute trailer uh, for our, our first Netflix show, Raising Dion, that it trended virally and it met with every studio and production company. and. You know, we're in post-production on this, you know, $60 million show from a guy who never made television or features from making a three-minute trailer they put out on the Internet. And, and that's happening more and more often now. Um, I think we have literally one minute left, so I think there's someone up here. To Jeremy's earlier point about brands currently kind of standing on the sidelines and not knowing how to participate in content, can you all talk about 
in this new paradigm of content you're creating, ways that brands have tried to engage, whether they've come to fruition or not, but do you have any working examples of just things that are percolating? Because uh, it is an exciting time for content, but brands have been there from day one, and it's big money. Steve, Charles, no? Uh, sure, well, I, you know, uh, from an AVOD perspective, uh, I would say that, you know, the ability, you know, the one benefit that AVOD has over broadcast is just dynamic ad insertion. So there's a technological advantage uh, that I think as these new AVODs, uh, as you mentioned earlier with the, the, the uh, oncoming AVOD services, that I think is going to be a really important way for just traditional ad insertions to happen in a, in a much more uh, productive and better way. But the conversation around brands is much larger, I think, today. And in part because of what you mentioned is that the ecosystem is closing and they have to have a strategic response. So what we're seeing uh, at Valence, because we own film, television, events, uh, digital content, is we're seeing brands engage in much more meaningful ways and from a dollar perspective uh, across the value chain and across multiple uh, product types. Um, particularly as traditional sort of product placement has kind of, you know, has, has kind of uh, gone out of favor. I mean, the conversation that we're having with brands now is much more, uh, it's much more strategic and it's much more really trying to not, to marry them with something that's going to feel very authentic to who they are. We represent a really talented uh, comedian named Billy Eichner who has who had this great show, Billy on the Street. And uh, I believe it was at Comedy Central, and they decided they didn't want to do the show anymore. He really wanted to keep doing the show, and we married him with Lyft. And now Lyft is as uh, is supporting the show, putting some financing into the show. I believe we've sold it to Hulu. I'm not sure where we've sold it to, but bringing Lyft in because it was such a great strategic fit for them has allowed the show to continue. And I think we'll be able to see more and more of those kind of examples of where brands really want to play and be not just dumb money, but a, a, a partner for the right brand with the right show at the right time. And we're finding brands are also approaching from a holistic point of view. You know, uh, they'll say, look, we'd like to get involved with things you're doing in film, television, as well as live events. And how is there a way to connect with you across all of the different verticals of your organization? And I think that you'll begin to see more things like that transpire over the, the coming years. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I feel like this conversation could keep going for, for a while. Thank you all to the panelists for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.